having us today. Um, feel free to ask questions as we go. It's a pretty informal presentation here. I think it took us a couple days to put together yesterday, today, pretty much. Um, <laughs> hope it'll be uh, interesting. We'll try and make it that way. Here's a little agenda. Um, talk a little bit about FICO. I don't know how much you guys know about FICO as a company. Everybody's probably heard of the FICO score, but uh, FICO actually does quite a bit more than just do the FICO score. Uh, talk about what we do in the group that I work for, which is fraud banking or fraud more generally. Um, and that's here in San Diego. And then we'll go over, start getting into the actual good stuff, which is uh, the technical stuff. Uh, how we do batch data processing online, how we're doing security uh, orchestration. Uh, we're doing some uh, tech search. We'll talk about that a little bit. And we also do some distributed caching, so we'll talk about the open source around that. And, uh, like I said, obviously feel free to ask questions as we go. Anything's not clear. Um, so, a little bit about the company. Um, started in 1956 as Fair Isaac, uh, Bill Fair and Bill Isaac. 1958 is when they first started working on the credit score, and um, the 1977 implements the first scoring system in Europe. So it's not just the United States, but it's, it's definitely heavily North American. The FICO credit score, as we know it today, was pretty much from 1981. In 2002, FICO bought a local company, Agency Software, and that is uh, the company how I started with FICO. Um, Agency Software was started by a professor from UCSD, uh, Heck Nielsen, Robert Heck Nielsen. And so HNC is Heck Nielsen Corporation. Went through a few different names, um, but uh, was uh, public in 1995 or 1996 as Agency Software. And what we did at HNC was build uh, credit card fraud detection as well as some other decisioning stuff like uh, how to do uh, loan origination products. And it was all about analytics. What, what um, Peck Nielsen focused on was uh, artificial intelligence neural networks. And that's at the core of uh, the product then and, and the products today, particularly the stuff that we do here in San Diego. Um, obviously 50 years in 2006 and 100 billion FICO scores. You guys all got your credit score, right? Mm -hmm. Very important stuff. I don't don't ask me any questions about the credit score, though. I know nothing about it. Um, but can you change it? I, <laughs> I can give you suggestions. However, I have no idea the details. Can we change it if we get a job? MyFICO.com. They started a good 10 years ago. You can go there, but obviously you're supposed to go read credit report, credit report once a year, right, for free. So, um, in addition to just doing scoring, um, which is what most people think of when they hear FICO, uh, basically, there's three main things that we do, um, if you don't include the professional services. The score, in terms of things we sell, product-wise, it's scores, applications, and tools. So scores, again, is what you typically think of as FICO, in terms of the credit scoring. But um, applications, which is uh, where Joe and I work, uh, everything from uh, fraud prevention, like what we'll talk about today, to loan origination, uh, debt collection, uh, and related things. So it's sort of the entire life cycle of how you might have um, banking products, like you apply for the loan, you do fraud, law, fraud prevention detection while you're processing, you know, while you have whatever it was that you applied for, and then say if you mess up and somebody needs to go and collect money and get the debt collection management stuff as well. We also have a small tools business which is selling tools to help you build models and analytics. So for example, um, one of the products that I worked on before uh, was uh, called Model Builder, which is uh, a basic tool for helping you build predictive models. And so we sell that as well. And, and But the main product there in the tools organization is a product called Blaze Advisor, which uh, is a Business Rules Management System, um, one of the two main commercial products. The other one is iLog, which got bought by uh, IBM. Blaze was actually an acquisition of HNC Software, and that's how it came to FICO. Um, so 
so if you went out there to try and find a business rules management system, ways, advisors, and, and ILA would probably be the two that you found. And of course, professional services, we offer a variety of services as far as helping you implement the products. Custom solutions as well. So we're here in San Diego. Um, that's the uh, location where uh, HNC Software was started and, and we moved to Carmel Valley and then got bought by uh, Merged, I should say, with Mike. <laughs> um, in addition to product development, there's obviously some, some other related uh, functions, but as far as development goes, we work here on both applications and tools. So for example, fraud stuff that I've talked about as well as model builder. But um, the main uh, group is, is the fraud banking group. And, and the two main products that we have are Falcon, which is the product that HSC started uh, back in the early 90s. <laughs> Sorry, it's just a coffee machine. Didn't like that. <laughs> and then a, a new product, and that's kind of what we're going to focus on today, is uh, application fraud manager, which um, when you apply for a loan or apply for a credit card, apply for even a, uh, you know, a mobile phone contract, all those applications, somebody could obviously misrepresent themselves and try and get away with uh, a little bit of fraud there. So the application fraud manager is the product uh, that tries and prevents the money from going out the door in the first place, whereas Falcon, for example, Every time you swipe your credit card, it goes and checks it for fraud, but obviously you've already issued the card. If you can not even give the person the card in the first place, um, obviously you can save yourself some, some money there. So as I said, we had the slide about the presenter. So I'm Ray. Um, I did just join FICO a year ago, January, but it's actually my second stint. As I mentioned, I was at HNC Software, uh, where I started in 97. Then I did a few other things like Peregrine Systems. Uh, I know a lot of the people at ServiceNow. Uh, some of them actually just went from FICO. But, um, and uh, just before FICO, I was at CoreLogic, which uh, is up in Carlsbad, but um, spun off from First American, which a uh, big title. Irvine. So Joe, maybe you want to talk about yourself a little bit? Sure. I'm uh, Joe Antonakia. Um, I'm a senior uh, senior uh, manager at, at FICO, uh, managing the application fraud manager project that we're going to focus on tonight. Um, so I have about 23 years or so of software experience. I started at MetLife in New York. Um, I did some work, um, lived in Atlanta for five years. Uh, most of that five years was spent at Adam Software, Adam.com, which was one of the cooler jobs I worked at, doing uh, animated dissection of human anatomy uh, through multimedia for med schools. It was really fun stuff to work on. Um, also did some consulting there. I also, from there I moved on to uh, Crestone International, which was a, a PeopleSoft consulting um, partner. Uh, so I did a few years of consulting on, on PeopleSoft applications and then settled down at Peregrine Systems. Uh, worked at Peregrine Systems, which got acquired by HP. He was there for uh, 12 years, I guess, or so. 11, 12 years. And then uh, ended up at FICO about a year and a half ago when uh, the Peregrine uh, software that HP acquired got shut down and moved to, uh, to China. So and you don't speak Chinese, so I do not. So. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so. Uh, we're going to talk just briefly about types of applications uh, that we build here in fraud banking. So Falcon, which I mentioned, uh, started in the early 90s. Um, right now it's something like 2.2 billion cards. Um, significant, you know, two-thirds percent of all the cards in the world transact through Falcon for, for uh, fraud prevention. It's not just credit cards, it's debit cards. And, um, is not just cards even now, we're also doing um, retail banking, so uh, debit account or you know, checking accounts, which you know, here we call them DDA, places <coughs> call them different things. 
but retail banking, online online banking, essentially. Plenty of patents, um, reducing significant amount of fraud losses. If you look at a curve, they have a chart. I remember seeing from the '90s where uh, you just saw the credit card fraud going up, and you can see the year that Falcon got introduced and just saw it turn uh, turn down. And that was uh, so. That was the thing that really made agency software and uh, allowed it to go public was, was just purely based on the back of this Falcon product, which is still going strong. Um, so all fraud products that we're building all have a very similar profile. Um, basically, you got your data coming in, running it through various analytics. Typically, the analytics with fraud are all neural networks. Um, Throughout FICO, they have uh, many different kinds of analytics that they apply, but the analytics that we do here in San Diego, it's all neural networks, and that's, again, that legacy from Hank Nielsen and HNC software. And then we apply business rules, like I mentioned, with Wade software, and that's <coughs> what we call scoring. And those decisions go back, so, for example, with Falcon, if you swipe your card at the point of sale, that transaction leaves that point of sale device, goes to the acquiring bank and manages that point of sale device out over Visa or MasterCard network into the card issuing bank. That card issuing bank is the one that runs Falcon. That Falcon transaction has to go through, get scored, and then all the way back to the point of sale device. And those associations, Visa and MasterCard, have very strict timeout. You know, if you don't respond within a certain <coughs> second, that transaction is voided. So, um, Falcon obviously has some, some type of time constraints, and uh, many of our customers integrate in that real-time loop. So while you're sitting there and you swipe the transaction, it goes through that entire process that I mentioned. So um, typical installations in the 300 to 500 TPS range, although some go a little bit higher. Obviously, if you do the math with 108 milliseconds, it doesn't really add up, but that's because we do it all in parallel. So we can score 30, 40, 50. Again, it all depends on the bank flowing. So that's the typical process that we have to worry about as far as scoring. And all that information gets stored in the database for a variety of reasons, not the least of which is then case management. So whether you're talking about Falcon or you're talking about the application fraud product, after the score is generated, so we're going to give you a score basically from 0 to 1, but we normalize it to 0 to 999, the higher the score, more likely it is fraud, but the computer can't actually tell you it's fraud. It's very likely it's fraud, but it can't tell you it's fraud. And so what happens then is we run rules that decide whether or not a human needs to, to review this, and then it goes off in case management. We have queues, which are ways of organizing your cases. Basically, you can think of them as views on the database. But basically, you're organizing your queues, like I have a high score queue, or I have a queue that is all the transactions of a certain type have fraud analysts that log in over the web to a browser-based interface to work those cases. And um, obviously, then there's some reporting that we do as well. And there's a bunch of other processes ancillary in terms of getting in demographic data feeds or uh, sending uh, extracts of the database back to FICO for doing um, additional modeling. So we ship them new, we ship customers new analytic models about every year or 18 months. So all the Falcon customers are part of a, trans a, a consortium. And they just, when they sign up, they have to send us all their transactions, and we go and uh, then build new models on that. So when we're building our software right now, we have an ability to leverage the fact that basically everything's the same in terms of the high-level approach of you got your feeds, you got your model, you got rules, you have queues, case review, et cetera. And so whether you're talking about Falcon, or you're talking about application fraud, or you're talking about some of the other initiatives that we're doing in fraud banking, we have a lot of commonality there that while um, the problem domain is different in terms of card fraud, or bank fraud, or application fraud, um, we can reuse a lot of the stuff that we're building now for quickly moving into new areas. Can I ask you a question? Sure. <coughs> you said on the front end, of Falcon is your own network. In the score of 
the, the neural network is the uh, stuff here in the middle, the analytic. So we get a, for example, a card transaction comes in and you swipe your card. That transaction then goes through the neural network, which will generate a score of a likelihood of fraud. So zero, not What I'm fraud. curious about is that rule set in the neural network human understandable? No. It, yeah, that's what I understand right. about neural nets. <laughs> yeah. So, so where do you apply the human logic in the business rule section? Yeah. Right. So this is just going to say 0 to 999. Right. And then you write a rule that says, OK, if it's over 700 and it's this type of transaction in this postcode, just decline that transaction and create a case. Or a my credit card is stolen. Some kid takes it, goes down and buys some gas, then he pigs at it. Carl's Jr.'s. If you've never eaten in Carl's Jr.'s, and then you, um, because neural net, now, I'm going to sort of tangent a little bit just because, neural, you know, I'm a software engineer, not an right. analytics scientist, but obviously um, get a little familiar with the way they do neural net. <coughs> it's basically a pattern matching thing, right? So here's your pattern, and all of a sudden your car gets stolen, and some guy buys a bunch of jewelry. Um, that's going to be something outside of your pattern, and that's going to bump up the score. The neural network, again, can't tell you that it's fraud. It just it looks suspicious. And so then they say it's abnormal. Exactly. Other pattern. So then that's where the business rules come in. And somebody <laughs> who's got some domain experience, like our professional services, which you can go and pay for, um, will come in and say, you know, based on your portfolio, scores over this should be referred for case management, declined, whatever, but then that's where you sort of encoding your business policy. So for example, you might say, I don't care how high the score is, this guy's a VIP, don't ever decline. Maybe create a case, but never decline that transaction. And um, so that's why it's all together in one box that I'm saying scoring. Is you can't really do just model because you still have to make some decision about what does that score mean for you as far as that for you being the bank at this point. What does that mean to your business? Um, maybe, again, it's a VIP that's so much business you don't care. And so you're willing to let that go just in case it was the VIP just deciding to go and buy something big opposed to it actually got stolen. But it'll you know, create a case, the person will come up and say, did you do this? And you say, yes, and okay, fine. Or no, and say, block that account or something. Thank you. So <coughs> this is trying to just show the difference between Falcon and app fraud. So Falcon, which is card fraud and retail banking, like I mentioned, is after the card, or whatever the product is, card, credit card, debit card, after you've already <coughs> issued it and you're watching the transactions go by. Whereas application fraud is you're applying for that loan, you're applying for the mortgage, you're applying for a telco contract. And so you have a chance to prevent the uh, product, whatever that might be, of going out. Whether, you know, For example, with a phone contract, you go, oh, what, why would you do app fraud on, on <coughs> phone contracts? But right, the, the phone companies give you big discounts if you sign up for contract. So you go, you get your iPhone, <coughs> charge you 200 bucks for an iPhone, but really the thing's 500 bucks if you didn't get a contract. So you go go around, get a bunch of phones, you pay 200 bucks, you go home sell to your buddy for 300 bucks, you just made $100. So even something like um, applying for a uh, you know, mobile phone contract is, is opportunity for fraud. Again, you don't necessarily know, but App fraud, just like Falcon, goes through the same process, and you have an ability to uh, at least check, if not actually prevent, uh, some of that fraud. So, what we're going to talk about today focuses on application fraud, primarily because the um, application fraud product is uh, pure Java, 100% Java. The Falcon product is a mix, partly because of legacy. So Falcon, again, started in the 90s. It was 100% C code, um, although we do have a mainframe version. <coughs> Everybody knows 
we said we're hiring a Java developer, but anybody knows a mainframe developer? <laughs> uh, well, see, that's the challenge. Is so, 80% of the code is C still, even on the mainframe. 20% COBOL, and it's very hard to find C programmers uh, for the mainframe. But uh, focusing on the Java bit, um, that's what we're going to talk about with uh, with you today, because it's 100% Java, and also um, Built it basically, you know, from from scratch to a V1 in about six months. Primarily because, you know, obviously we're able to leverage open source, which is why we're talking about it today. So for processing batch data, as I showed you on that slide earlier, basically you have two feeds: batch and online, and um, we use Spring Batch. So one thing I'm not going to talk about is sort of just the basic Spring framework stuff. Hopefully some experience with that. If not, um, ask questions as we go, but I'm not going to talk about how you configure Spring and dependency injection. We'll assume that there's some basic Spring experience and just jump right into one of the projects, which is Spring Batch. Spring Batch um, is a way to schedule batch jobs, uh, and it doesn't have to run in an app server or Tomcat server container or something like that. You can do it purely command line. The way that we're doing it is currently through Tomcat um, as a web application where we drop batch files in the landing zone and have a job get kicked off, but you can also use Spring Batch in a purely uh, command line environment. So what we get out of Spring Batch is this concept of jobs where uh, every batch file that you drop sent through the system is, is considered a job, and they're all stored in a repository, basically uh, RDBMS, so that you can do various things like restarting jobs, but there's all this job management around it. Spring Batch also has this mechanism for doing uh, input and output of all those records that you're reading out of files and transforming it in the process of, of going through the batch job. You can also have a transaction boundary. so. What that provides you with Spring Batch is the ability to restart your batch job. So you think you, you know, you've got a batch file, you've got 10 million records that you're trying to process, and it craps out at the 9 millionth record, right? You have to start all over the place. You know, start back at the beginning, but with the transaction support and job restart, because of the job repository, you're able to pick up where you left off. I talked about a configurable workflow. It's not really workflow in the sense of it's not uh, JVPM or something like that. But within a job, a job is made up of job steps, and you have a, a way, whether it's through the Spring configuration or through uh, programming, to figure out what the next step is in the sequence. So you can skip steps or uh, a little bit of workflow in there. Spring Batch also has the ability to um, send the processing of a record or records to different nodes. So you have some built in distribution capability to allow the, the offloading of, of processing of, of the records. And like a lot of Spring, it's extremely extensible. So you know, they provide quite a bit of stuff out of box, but there are extension points throughout, whether it's annotations for callbacks that, you know, before or after your job starts, or before or after a step, a job step executes, or before or after a particular record is written. But you can extend the heck out of it, and, and I'll show you an example of that later. <coughs> so, um, all jobs are in a repository. Each job's made out of, uh, uh, the job's made out of steps, and then each step you basically read, process, and write. So, <coughs> the input can be pretty much anything that uh, could be a Spring resource. So, Spring provides a resource abstraction, and so a resource could be a file, but obviously you're talking about batch files. Typically you're either going to do batch file to batch file or batch file to a database. Sometimes you'll get queues to a database. It doesn't really matter. You can specify what that resource is. But as each job goes, each step does a certain part of the processing and you basically read a chunk, and I'll get to that more in a little bit because that's the basis of your uh, job restart how big this end records is. But it reads the end records, 
passes it into a processor where you do something to each record and then may or may not write it out. The example I'll show in a bit actually don't write it out anywhere. Because we're passing it on to the orchestration layer, which is actually what Joe's going to talk about later, because we're using uh, another Spring project to do uh, orchestration. So we're basically reading a record, transforming it, and then sending it off to, a, to another system rather than writing it out. <coughs> Any questions so far? So, um, if you aren't familiar with Spring, um, Spring provides an ability to have essentially a DSL and an XML. So you can have uh, specific, in this case, batch-related XML constructs that differ from your typical bean notation in Spring. So typically you would say bean and you have something like this. <coughs> but with Spring, uh, you can have custom configuration elements. In this case, we're prefixing everything by batch. So this is one example of how you would create a batch job. And I think I tried to be fancy here. So this is the hookup as far as the way that you define a step and then the actual step implementation is just a reference. Parent is not really a, I don't know why they called it parent because it's not parent in the sense of uh, in spring you have a concept of abstract beans and then concrete beans. You can say you know, this is my parent. That's probably actually technically how they implemented it but in this context it's not really a parent bean, it's just a bean reference that to implement that um, step. So this batch end on star is one of those constructs where you can control the, the flow that I was saying, just that sort of workflow-y type thing. In this case, you're saying uh, end this job on any return from uh, this batch step. It doesn't matter what happened in, that, in this second step. There's one step here, second step here. And as you can see, it says next is the next step. And then within that step, it says end. It doesn't matter what, what happened in that step, just finish that job. But you could have, rather than next here, where it says next delete file, this one doesn't have a next. You put batch next, you know, on success, go to this step, on failure, go to that step. Um, so there's some within each step, you can put some configuration there. Uh, using a construct like that, where star obviously means anything, but you can put some specific batch status. Another thing to point out is this concept of incrementers and job repositories. So every job, like I mentioned, has to be in a repository, and this is a bean reference to the definition of the job repository. The incrementer is the interesting bit in that um, every job has to have a job ID, and depending on how you configure your job, you can't reuse the same ID if you try and run a job that has an ID that's already in the database, it'll choke. Um, because the idea is you can go and say, hey, that was a job that ran, I want to restart that particular job. In this case, what we're doing here is providing a way for each time that job runs, just incrementing the, the job ID. So that's, again, a bean reference to a class that implements uh, Spring Batch interface that's just going to, in this case, it just goes and increments uh, whatever the, uh, the uh, previous job ID is. So here um, is what I was mentioning as far as you have a step that does <coughs> and writing or reading, processing and writing. And as you can see, there is no being here that's the item writer. So again, we have a reader, it's a reference to another bean, which I'll show in a second, and then processing of whatever came out of that uh, reader. So in this case, we're using an out-of-box um, class from Spring Batch that allows you to adapt any, using reflection, any method on any bean. So what we're saying here is um, call this other bean and invoke the score method. So go find this bean, call score on it, pass it, whatever came out of the reader. And so this is just uh, 
uh, a generic uh, adapter class that just by reflection takes in, you know, it this conforms to the item processor interface, which this doesn't. So it just provides some adapter between item processor interface and whatever existing method you might have. In this case, we have this scoring gateway class that um, we're adapting into the Spring Batch framework. Finally, on this slide here is the commit interval. So what I was mentioning about the job restart and the end records, this is basically the end records. So you're saying read, read, read from this input file or input source, whatever the resource might be, and read it up to whatever this value is. In this case, we're saying a default is 25. This is, that line there is using Spring's expression language. So before they had, <coughs> You could use, you know, JSF had its expression, you had a bunch of different expression languages. And Spring uh, standardized and created their own expression language. So in this case, we're just saying, you know, if there's a configuration other out there that says what the commit interval is, use that, otherwise use the 25. So in this case, if it was the default 25, it would read 25 records from the input file before calling the uh, processor. And that chunk, data is your window of, of retry failure, right? So if you failed somewhere in there before it committed and you then went and retried your job, restarted your job, it would only go back as far as whatever that end, whatever that window is. So here's the batch reader that I was that uh, was referred to from the other um, uh, other configuration. One thing to note here, so what it's reading from this flat file reader, this is again a class from Spring Batch, but it has a custom scope here. So if you're familiar with Spring, they have the concept of scope for a beam, and typically it's been uh, singleton or prototype, prototyping, you're gonna create a new beam every time. And they've extended it over time to include um, sort of web-related stuff for Spring Webflow in terms of uh, like request context. But Spring allows you, and you don't have to be Spring, like this is coming from Spring Source. You can create your own scope as well. And what Spring Batch guys have done is create a scope called Step Scope. So this, what that means in this context is that this beam won't get instantiated until Step executes. Why is that important? It's because of the next line there that I highlighted, which is the resource to read from for this uh, step. Obviously, it wouldn't do you much good if you hard-coded that uh, resource name and all you could do is ever read the same file name over and over again. What step scope allows you to do is then use parameters to the job to control what file, in this case, to read from. So when we launch the job, every job has job parameters. One of the parameters in this case is an input file reference. And so obviously job parameters are only good for that job. So if you instantiate it ahead of time, there are no job parameters. You have to wait until a job executes. And that's what step scope's there for, is allow you to pick up things from the execution of the job to help configure the execution of that job. The other thing to note here is this relates to the extensibility I mentioned. So one thing that you have to do, obviously, when you're reading files is figure out how to go from this flat record, which might be delimited or it might be fixed length record, <coughs> and turn it into some Java object or whatever it is that you want to process. So they have a concept of a line map where you're mapping that input line to something else. In this case, we've created our own implementation of a line mapper, which goes to this application line mapper class, and so um, you know, we've, we've just gone and extended Spring that way. But if you look at the next <coughs> example, which is a different reader implementation, it's still in step scope, it's still the same flat file reader, it's still doing the same kind of job parameters, but now we're using out-of-box Spring classes, so mm -hmm. they provide a default line mapper. This class takes two things. One is a line tokenizer, how do you split up that input line? And then they have a mapper, which is once you've tokenized it, how do you map that to some Java object? 
And so purely using configuration, we're saying, okay, well, the input's going to be delimited. Here's the delimiter. We could have parameterized that if we wanted to, but we're saying it's always going to be common delimited file. And then what we're saying is these are the um, tokens that are going to come out of that tokenization step so that when it's passed to the field set mapper, you'll have an array of, in this case, two things, identification number and report, which will have two values, which they can then, the field set mapper will, um, in this case, we'll custom field set mapper and take that input and map it to <coughs> we have a bureau report. Um, obviously, if you're familiar with applying for anything, right, getting your credit report is a big part of figuring out whether or not they're going to give you some money, and so we get bureau reports uh, quite a bit with application fraud. So, any questions about that? There's a sort of custom, <coughs> there's out of, uh, you know, out of box stuff, and then ability to that instantiation of these beans until your job actually runs. I have sort of a question just on the, the input. So like an organization that's using this product, they're, they're creating a file and dumping it in some directory? Yep. And then you're reading it out of there? Yeah. So this one's, they can't be the same interface as the um, 100 millisecond one. It's got no, be. so this is just batch. So we'll talk about um, online in a second. Um, or at least one aspect of the online uh, interface. Um, but yeah, there's there's two ways that typically we integrate with customers. And one's um, uh, batch files. So um, the batch would be applications um, or um, online REST web services, and you get XML that way. So in this case, they either flatten it out into a common delimited or one of the things that working on for the next release is uh, actually a batch file of XML. So you have sort of an XML of XMLs that comes in. But it would be this, you know, the approach is exactly the same. Somehow you tell Spring Batch what is a line. In this case, the line would be a whole XML record. Um, and then what to do with it. But yeah, this so is purely this, batch. This mapper is pulling out Yeah, whatever you tell it, in this case, it's these two values. So the assumption is that um, you've got two values in that uh, file. So you configure your, your reader, in this case, to say, I've got a batch file, and it's in this format. In this case, the format is a common separated file with two values in it. It's not that big a deal, but it, as it turns out, the report is a big XML uh, log of the bureau report. But um, it could be, you know, a 50 column, comma separated thing. The only difference is this would be quite a bit longer to specify all the different things that you would, you would get. So you're telling it how to split it up, right? This is the tokenizer. How do I take that input line and split it up into tokens? And then how do I take those tokens and put it in the job option? And that's the out-of-box stuff, or you could do it like we did up here, which is just sort of do it all in custom code. So from the administration perspective, is, is there a console or something that I can see given a time, I can see how many batches are running or what's going on in the cluster? Uh, yes and no. Spring Batch <laughs> provides an admin web application, but not as an official part of the product. But because everything's in a repository, and they expose everything um, via JMX and web services. <coughs> it's easy to build your own as well. So because all all that information, and I'll get to the schema later as far as what's actually persisted in the database. But every job, every job execution, job parameters related to that job execution, every step execution, the context for every step, all of that's in the database. And so you can see all of that. If you want to pull it, you can see it as it's updating. Um, and obviously, you can go in there and say, hey, hey, I want to rerun that job. So they do provide an admin web app, but it's really an example. They don't ship it as part of Spring Batch. And so um, that would be the kind of thing that, for example, we would build ourselves. 
to expose whatever we wanted to expose as far as the administration goes. So when you refer to database, is it something that comes with that, or you have your own database and you could have that? It's our own database. You pick whatever you want. They provide the schema, so you don't have to worry about defining the schema. You just need to give it a data source and you're done. Um, so here's an example of customizing Spring. So they provide all kinds of out-of-box functionality, like I mentioned, as far as the kinds of steps that you can do. But sometimes you just need to do something that they don't provide. And so very easy to uh, do your own job step. In this case, um, you can extend abstract step or you can implement the step interface. So in that previous XML, we had this uh, reference a delete file step. And so we created our own class. And there's the whole thing. Um, and the idea was, after the job's over, we want to remove the semaphore that triggered the file that kicked off the job. So um, by removing that semaphore, the next time the system starts up, it's not going to try and run that job again. So all you got to do is, there's your um, method. In this case, because we're extending abstract step, they implement the execute method and then they do a template pattern that we'll call do execute for you with the step execution. So again, this is what I was referring to about every step has an execution context and keeps a lot of information about what's going on with that job step. And then you do whatever you're going to do. In this case, we just delete the file, but um, then you're able to define what's the status of that step. And again, I mentioned before about the, uh, the batch end on asterisk in the config, that's the kind of thing that you would then um, check on is this exit status. You can do different things based on what the step execution status is. So maybe if the, the, the delete step failed, you'd want to go to an error step and do something differently. But that's how you would control that in your own custom class by setting exit status. How would you test that? Or how do you test that? So um, we have a variety of, of tests, unit tests and, and um, integration tests around Spring. Um, what we actually do with something like this is um, just integration test it, because obviously, in this case, we can't mock out or stub that file class because we're renewing it right there wanted to, we could have more of a factory kind of thing there and make it easier to mock that out. But we do integration test this where we have um, the uh, input file that's on the class path that gets copied into um, a temporary directory and then we just, in the, in the integration test, we just touch a semaphore file to kick off the job. And because you can monitor the progress of the job, um, and wait for it to finish, and then you can check the step status and things like that. So, um, not the easiest class right there to test, but we do have a lot of um, batch integration tests that are we're actually copying files around. After the job is finished, we get the job exit status, um, go read that file and count the lines and things like that. So it's like, hey, there are 100 in the input, there should be 100 on the output. Some of it is very easy to unit test, some of it's a little harder. <coughs> this custom thing where we're actually doing a file in there, it's a little hard to test that class. You could do it. You could, because uh, that parameter value comes from ultimately step execution. You could use something like Mockito to inject that path, and you could. Yeah, but it's this step right here that's in. How do you prevent it from actually calling file delete? Yeah, so I could pass in whatever I want, but it's still going to try and do a file delete, and it'll always choke on that. So you can verify that it really did that. Yeah. Oh, well, you can verify that it really choked. <laughs> <laughs> no, that it really deleted the file. Well, right. But the, um, so that's what we are doing, right? So, but not from a unit test. We're doing that from an integration test. So that is is exactly what we're doing there, but just not from a, a unit test. What we try and do, I'm paranoid about unit tests and integration tests. It's just 
us in differentiating it. No, but I mean, wouldn't that be <clears throat> a reasonable test? Like, when it goes into the do execute method, the file should exist. Mm -hmm. And when it's done execution, you can verify that right. the file was deleted. Right, that's what we do. But for us, that's an integration test. Doesn't need to be. That could be a unit test with Mockito mocking step execution. So you, know, you could create like a temp file or something? Or yeah, sure. You can create it in java.io.tempter. Sure. And all I'm saying is that I don't consider that a unit test because it's actually doing real I.O. to the file system. Okay. That's all. Okay. For me, I would mock that out so you wouldn't actually call file leak because that's not something that, for me, the way that we try and do in our group, can't do any I.O. Okay. That's all. So yeah. However you want to do it, yes, you can call a unit test, call an integration test. Yeah, you can't test it. We just do it in the integration test. You pass in real files. I mean, real quote unquote files, because it's still just something that's in the main target directory that we copy over. There. So you when I'm trying Maven. to do, we do use Maven. <laughs> Actually, we were <laughs> Joe and I were talking about whether or not we should put in a slide about all the the build and continuous integration and all that stuff that we do. I mean, Maven, Jenkins, Sonar. That? Oh well, that's not free. That's not open source. Um, so just a quick, we touched on it a little bit um, as far as administering jobs because everything's in the repository. Um, you have quite a lot of options as far as what it is that you want to do, whether it's building your own web app or trying to leverage the one that Spring provided. Um, but you know, you can do reporting. You can restart jobs. All kinds of different stuff. It keeps, as you'll see in a second, I think on the next slide, it keeps a lot of information there. But one good thing that they do that makes it easy to do some testing is that uh, they have an in memory repository. Um, and I'm not talking about something like H2, but actually just they have maps. So their, um, their repository implementation that's in memory is they have a series of, of basically just hash maps. Um, but you could also obviously use. RDBMS data source to something like MySQL or uh, do the same thing to embed it <coughs> to the database. Um, and like I mentioned before, the DDL is provided by Spring, so you don't have to figure out what that DDL is or um, all you have to do is, is uh, make sure that the database tables are there if you're using the RDBMS. And the schema is probably not readable, but um, these are just sequence tables that they have. But here is uh, job parameters, jobs, execution context, step execution context. The stuff that they have here, for example, is uh, so when did it start, stop, what's the status? You can read that. Commit count, read count, filter count, write count, skip count, read skip, write skip, etc. Process skip. I don't even know what that is. Um, exit codes. So, as those steps execute, you got quite a lot of information about what's going on with your job. And if you were to pull that, you could obviously do some very interesting things as far as you know, you may watch the job execution go or whatever. But all that information is in the database, and um, unless you go in and clean that up, it stays there. Spring doesn't have any kind of data, so you have to make your own aging um, criteria for jobs. But because all the information is there, including job execution date, and it's all tied together, it'd be pretty easy to manage around that as well. You have to use courts yourself if you want to do scheduling. So let's, another thing I debated about putting in here, because while they have jobs, they leave scheduling up to you. And what we've done in the past, we're not doing it for app fraud yet, right? But um, uh, the typical thing that I've used in the past with Spring Badge is Quartz. The problem is that Quartz also has a concentrated job. So it's not a Quartz job? No, this is a Spring Badge job. Quartz <coughs> has a job, and obviously there's clashes in the names there make it a little bit of a pain, but 
if you do want to schedule jobs, um, they they provide some integration, as I recall, because they do have. Um, that's probably all the courts. Yeah, you have to do courts and um, just deal with the fact that there's jobs on both sides and keep you track of it's a courts job versus spring batch job. It's a little bit of a pain. So that's all I had on um, batch data. Um, moving on to online, um, talk a little bit about rest. I don't know. Um, is it want to want to break? Okay.